Stay tuned. Ahead, I'll talk with Diana McLean-Smith about remaking the space between us, how citizens can work together to build a better future for all. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner, and this is Some Books Considered. Diana McLean-Smith has spent over 35 years helping organizations transform intergroup conflict into a powerful force for change. Her groundbreaking leading through relationships approach has been used by thousands of teams and organizations around the world. Her previous books include Divide or Conquer and The Elephant in the Room. She joins us to talk about Remaking the Space Between Us, how citizens can work together to build a better future for all. Diana, welcome to Some Books Considered. Thank you so much, Dan. Great to be here. Well, in the beginning of the book, you talk about how we appear to live in such a divided nation politically. But then you go on to point out that when you look at the nation as a whole, we may not be as divided as people think. That's right. Um, Because the press leads with what leads, they tend to focus on the most extreme voices, both in Congress and in the general population. And what that does is it masks the 67% that more in common uncovered in their research a number of years ago, uh, that actually is far more flexible and far more pragmatic ideologically, open to uh, interesting and creative solutions to problems that are going unsolved because we're so polarized. Uh, so there's a large group of people out there who are much more amenable Uh, to working across differences, not even divides, because they're not all that divided. They're interested in working across differences. And then there's 77% of us who really yearn for greater unity, uh, really yearn to reduce the polarization. And they're getting increasingly exhausted and unfortunately despairing because what they read about in the paper and on cable news, what they see leads them to believe that there's no way out. And so that's one of the reasons I wrote the book is because there's a large group of us whose voices need to be heard, who need to stay involved in the political process so that we don't cede our power to the extremists on either the left or the right. Put this in perspective for us. What's the context? How did we get to where we are today? In terms of how we got here, it's a really interesting Um, inquiry that I found myself setting out upon because one thread led to another thread, which led to another thread. The first thread was really just looking at our nation and going back to our founding. It's clear that we have always lived in separate groups divided along two lines, one of which is ideological, our different beliefs, our different views on what ought to happen. And that's the thing that gets the most press. The second is demographics. We're divided along demographic lines by race, by generation, uh, by class, by geography. We tend to live with people of the same ilk, okay? And that has been true since our founding. There's nothing new about that. But every so once in a while, usually under some external pressure, um, we've had this happen in the past, we become more insular and more closed-minded within our own groups. We, we go there for safety and comfort when we feel under threat, okay? And we get more and more distant from groups that are not like us. So the more insular we get within our own groups, the more distant we get from groups that are not like us. And the more distant we get from groups that are not like us, the more insular and closed we become within our group. And you get this vicious cycle that gets worse and worse. And that's what we've seen happen over the past 50 years with so much of the dislocations we've seen globally in climate change, migration, war. Under all of those threats, we see this dynamic of demographic and ideological groups becoming more insular within and more distant across. And that's the story underneath polarization that I uncovered. So I'll say more about that in a moment, if you'd like, but that's really the surface story. 
And and also, I want to concentrate on your solutions to this, how we can as individuals and perhaps societally change that dynamic. But before we talk about some specifics, because obviously we can't cover everything in this book, give us a brief overview of what readers will find here. Well, I mean, first of all, I I, I will touch then on how is it that we've segregated ourselves within groups? Is it that we're bad people? That's one of the things that you'll often hear. It's not. It really isn't. It's a legacy of our evolution as a species. Long, long, long ago, when we were trying to survive and we had the saber-toothed tigers out there, we discovered early on that it's easier to go hunting if you had one or two people with you and you collaborated. And then things got a little more complex, even back then, and more competitive, even back then. And so we, we created groups. And we began to cooperate within groups in order to survive. That was the impetus. We needed to survive. So we created these groups in order to survive. And by creating these groups, we created group structures, we created group norms, and we created group identities. What people overlooked is that the reason we did all of that cooperation within groups was so we could compete better across groups. So at the same time that as a species, we learned to cooperate within, we learned how to compete better across groups. That legacy is with us today. And what we're facing today is an imperative because of the nature of today's problems to take in-group cooperation and translate it to across group cooperation because none of the problems we're facing today that are threatening our survival, like climate change, war, migration, all of those require us to cooperate across groups because those problems don't have boundaries. What happens in the Amazon when they burn the forest affects us here. Okay, I was last summer, summering in New York and the fires from Canada affected me. So that's one of the big issues that I want us to understand is that the way we organize ourselves now, the way we live within groups is simply a legacy of our evolution. And it's now within our interest. We have a self-interest, all of us, in learning to cooperate across groups. Because if we don't, then it becomes self-destructive. Right, exactly. I mean, it's one of the parts of the book talks about the importance of reimagining our democracy, not as an adversarial democracy, but as a democracy among citizens who are friends. And friends have a self-interest in the interest of their friend, because if they don't, the friendship won't last very long. But our country was built on an adversarial notion of democracy, which again was a product of beliefs that were emerging in the 1700s in Europe. And that was based on our evolution. We looked around at where we were in our evolution and we said, wow, it's cooperate within your group and compete against other groups. As if that was a natural state as opposed to an evolutionary state. And evolution is nothing more than learning as a species how to adapt to your current threats and circumstances. So that's how we adapted then. And today we need to adapt by learning how to cooperate across groups. And by the way, if Neanderthals could learn how to cooperate within groups, we ought to be able to learn how to cooperate across groups. I'm talking with Diana McLean Smith about remaking the space between us, how citizens can work together to build a better future for all. And our conversation continues in a moment. If you appreciate this discussion, please subscribe, like, and click on the bell so you'll know when I post new interviews. And thank you. Let's talk about the implications on the individual level, because a lot of people find it hard to interact with others, especially when it comes to political differences, and they approach it like a debate. You know, their goal is to try to convince the other person that they are right, but they're not really listening to what the other person is saying. Well, let me start by saying, how's that working out for you? <laughs> not well. <laughs> not well, okay? And, and think about why it's not working out. Because the other person wants to be heard just as much as you do. So they're not going to listen to you if you're not listening to them. So that's number one. Number two, we're so interested in winning our case 
that we build an airtight case rather than build a relationship. And a lot of the research that I did and a lot of the stories that you'll read about in the book, and there's one after another after another, which are highly instructive, talk about how people built a relationship, usually working on a common problem at the local level. And the problem might be in the environment. The problem might be um, immigration. The problem might be uh, the economy. The problem might be any number of problems. They start working together at a local level and they work across these demographic and ideological divides to solve a common problem. And they start building relationships in order to do that. They say, okay, we have a common problem here. We want to create a community where hate doesn't lead to violence. Okay. We want to create a community where uh, economically we're thriving as a city. That's the story of Maine. And then they start to get to work and they start building relationships. And before you know it, they're starting to discover that they share a lot in common, a lot of values, a lot of basic beliefs. I've worked with somebody in my organization now for going on 30 years. And she's very different from me politically. And she was worried about ever talking about her political beliefs with her boss. Okay. And I was respectful of that. So I never pride or prodded to try to understand where she stood or what her beliefs were or how to convince her. Instead, we developed a relationship and we discovered how much we have in common. We share a deep belief in a deep in a work ethic. Uh, we believe we believe in hard work. We believe in responsibility, personal responsibility. We believe in mutual responsibility. Um, I mean just a whole bunch of values which have allowed us to be able to find, co- not people talk about finding common ground. Oftentimes you got to create it, but you can only create it on things that you share. And we keep going for the places we differ. And that's important, by the way. I don't want to obfuscate our differences, but you need to have some kind of foundation upon which to create common ground. Another idea that you talk about is the idea of bridge building. What do you mean by that term and how do we implement that? Well, a number of organizations that I studied, um, and by the way, I would just recommend a couple here if I could. One is called um, Starts With Us. It's a website. It has a lot of exercises and helps people to figure out um, how how they navigate these differences and divides in our culture. Another is the Listen First Project, which lists hundreds of organizations anybody could join. Um, And then there's uh, Citizen Connect. Again, if you're concerned about the polarization, there are organizations out there with people like you and me who are working together to try to solve that problem. And they have enormous number of resources. So I would just recommend them. The thing about bridge building that people overlook is that you can't build a bridge if you don't first look at yourself and your own group and your own beliefs, your own biases, are there things that you're doing to create a divide that needs a bridge, to perpetuate a divide that needs a bridge? Are you going into it with a set of assumptions about the other side that will make it impossible to build a bridge? This again, bridge building means being able to connect with people whose experiences, whose backgrounds, whose beliefs may be different from yours, but as I said before, but who may have a bunch of things that are similar to you. Until you look at yourself and your own beliefs and assumptions about the other sides, you can't build a bridge. That's why Moore and Common did research on people's, what they call people's perception gaps. And they discovered that Democrats and Republicans both overestimated the percentage of people in the other party who held extreme views, as they would define extreme views, they overestimated them by twice as much. They also discovered that people who read the news frequently are three times more likely to distort events than those who do not read the news frequently. Because the media stand between us and reality. They mediate how we view reality for us. And again, they have an economic self-interest 
in presenting us with the most extreme cases. That's why Roger Isles told Judy Woodruff back in the 1980s, if you get two candidates on the stage, one talking about how to get a Middle East peace plan and the other falls in the orchestra pit, he said, who do you think they're going to cover? The orchestra pit. So we've got to become much more self-aware of the forces that are leading us to have these assumptions about the other side that prevent us from building those bridges. Now, there's so much more in the book that we won't have time to talk about. What would you say are some of the key concepts that you hope readers are going to take away from reading the book? Well, I think the first one is I th- uh, is we need to better understand how we came to where we are today. And so one concept in the book is that uh, we need to understand that we are all products of history. Um, we didn't get here out of nowhere. All of us are shaped by our history. Well, in what ways has history shaped our divides? And so one concept is to talk about how our history shaped the divides we have today. It's important to understand that. So again, we can understand some of the assumptions we take to that and we can revisit them and we can reach across divides. So that's one. The second is to understand that there are not, uh, I thought it was tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands to millions of people are working today across the country on local problems. So they, they're they working in organizations that are locally rooted, but nationally connected, trying to bridge these divides so that we can solve common problems. We have very urgent problems out there that we've got to solve from climate change to immigration to economic dislocations. The only way we're going to solve them is by working together. You can't just elbow different groups out of the equation because they will fight back. And when they fight back, everything grinds to a halt. So we've got to learn how to work across groups. And there are hundreds of thousands of people leading the way. And the book tells about those organizations. It tells about their stories. It explains what they're doing. It talks about the things we need to do. And I also have, since I stopped writing the book, I've discovered a bunch of things I hadn't known. So I launched a Substack newsletter called Remaking the Space. And I start to report out more information about what I'm finding and what I'm discovering and places people can go to get help. To learn more, the book is Remaking the Space Between Us, How Citizens Can Work Together to Build a Better Future for All. It's by Diana McLean-Smith. Diana, thank you for talking with me today. You're welcome, Dan. It's been great talking with you. I really appreciate your having me on the show. If you'd like to purchase Remaking the Space Between Us, I've placed a link for you in the description below. And if you'd like to see more videos about books and their authors on a wide variety of topics, be sure to subscribe, like, and click on the bell to be notified about future programs. I'm Dan Skinner. Thank you for watching this edition of Some Books Considered.